And that makes all the difference in the world because when you're watching television, tear gas isn't the same as when you're in it. My first encounter with tear gas was when we went to Palestine and we were in the midst of a clash that was taking place. They go to the site where they're, where they're working, getting closer and closer to our camp. They're only two miles away now. And, they're, and so they try to, they pray at the spot where they're, they've been working at night and day. And um, so then they, they surround the police, the army of police and, and SWAT surrounded the people and they, they ended up chasing them and the people were, were running just like it was in Wounded Knee, you know, they, they ran for the river. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle has shown that over 30... <clears throat> Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle has shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City and in Washington, D.C. Our YouTube channel is Struggle Video, Video Media and our website is thestruggle.org. I returned a couple days ago from a Wheels of Justice anti-racism tour with a score of people driving three vans over 3,000 miles. We started at a Connecticut river town, drove to DC and Charleston and Atlanta and Americus, Georgia, Selma, Montgomery, Memphis, Tennessee, then on our way back, Cherokee, North Carolina, and a number of other places. We talked about the joint effort to fight racism against blacks, Palestinians, and Native Americans. I met some extraordinary people and saw some terrific projects, and we'll be showing them to you in the weeks to come. We started Emory University in Atlanta with Cassandra Henderson, who worked at the Ebenezer Baptist Church right in the very office of Martin Luther King Jr. She had gone to Palestine and reflected on issues of black and Palestinian lives. Then back near the start of the journey in Washington, D.C., where the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation has made an important decision. We end up with Native American Travis Harden speaking about events in the community where he is living with other protectors of the water and the land, Standing Rock. I um, lived in California for seven years, uh, three and a half years in LA and three and a half years in the Bay Area. And during my time there, I um, worked in the entertainment industry in Southern California. So a lot of what I will share with you is from a storyteller's perspective. And it's how I encounter the world around me. And so um, as we got to meet with the people who were there, I heard their stories and I was discussing it um, earlier that I really wanna go back because what I didn't do was capture their stories via recording so that I could recreate and reproduce for people here to see and understand what it is like to not only hear the story but to experience the reality of what we're facing. It's, it's one thing to see a picture, it's totally different to walk in a space. What, what, what you miss from a picture or from the news are the sights, the smells, the way it feels, the energy that we give off and we receive. It's the human experience. And that makes all the difference in the world because when you're watching television, tear gas isn't the same as when you're in it. My first encounter with tear gas was when we went to Palestine and we were in the midst of a clash that was taking place. And I remember us being on this bus and, you know, I'm a little bit of a rebel rouser. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is where we're going. I'm ready. So they're like, okay, no, mm -mm. you're going to need, you're going to need some forms of protection for yourself so that you can really even just walk because in that space, it was a very small, I mean, it was a street it was outside, but for all the tear gas that was coming over the walls and the distance, there were tanks coming down. And once we stepped off the bus, I couldn't see, like I literally could not see. My eyes were watering and it was burning and it, it burned me to breathe. Mm -hmm. And um, there's nothing that a, pic a picture can't capture that experience. 
the way that living, I don't know if anybody in here has ever experienced tear gas before, but to not be able to breathe. And the only people who were outside were young people. They were children, high schoolers, middle schoolers, elementary schoolers. They were coming home. Well, they, it was a Friday, so there was no school. And so the way that they're doing it is, is um, to negotiate one's existence, to hold them hostage in their homes, is to have these so-called clashes where your only option to breathe is to be inside. It's how they keep you inside when you're out of school. Can you imagine? The other thing that struck me about being there was we were in Hebron. And when we walked into the marketplace, first of all, I was shocked because it looked like all the pictures that I had seen of um, maybe Berlin during the 40s, during the Holocaust time, the ways that everything was structured. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. But everything was shut down. So it looked like this had been cleared out of all people until you turn around and there's a marketplace, an Israeli marketplace, and it's fully functioning. But all of the Palestinian stores and markets are totally shut down and had been shut down for a week in an effort to make life uncomfortable so that they would leave. They couldn't earn wages to feed their families. They couldn't provide. They couldn't even go into their shops if they had forgotten something or needed something. They were closed. And they were monitored by the military. And when we came in as a group of mostly um, you know, black American people, and we're looking at all this, and we all got our cameras out, and we're taking pictures, the, um, the soldiers come by and they look at us and they just keep going. And then a little while later, a car, just a regular car, drives slowly by us. Now this is a group of black people from the United States of America. I, having lived in Oakland and in Los Angeles, if somebody in a regular car rolls up on me, my first thought is a drive-by. Mm -hmm. To have a car drive very slowly, filled with settlers, very visibly disgruntled settlers, looking at us in a very malicious way, a threatening way, piercing their eyes closed, as if to say, you have no place here. And all they do is drive by, but in that moment, everybody in my group had a point of reference that took us across the world. And we were no longer American citizens. We were those who were not supposed to be there. And shortly thereafter, the same soldiers that had driven by before said, open up these shops because it was bad press for American people to be taking pictures of closed down shops and turning around and seeing this Israeli um, marketplace wide open. So they opened the shops and we went in and we were like, all right, we're going to buy as much as we can because we know you all have not had business in over a week. And we went into the stores and I promise you in less than five minutes, another military vehicle came by and said, close these shops down. Because the saddlers had complained. And so within moments, like to have your life hanging on a thread that someone else's dissatisfaction by your very existence could be shut down, just like that. I remember standing there and of course, you know, I'm shopping. I'm like, I got to get everything for everybody. And I'm there and the soldier comes. This is the first time I've ever had a machine gun shot, you know, in, in my face, just pointed in my face. And I'm, 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 I turn around and I'm startled because I'm like, you're pointing, like I'm thinking like, you're pointing that at me. He's like, the stores are closed. You know, maybe I'm just used to being around weapons. I don't know. But I got a little bold in the moment. And I was like, I'm not finished. <laughs> you know, and, and it's crazy when I think about it. If I had to redo it, maybe I would have thought twice. But, you know, I, I, in that moment, I was just like, I'm not finished. And he was like, fine, finish. 
and you know, <laughs> so he rung up all my little dresses, and as I, as he was ringing it up, I just kept grabbing more stuff. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'm a little more fearless than I ought to be, but it was amazing in the moment because I don't think any of us were afraid as much as we were furious. Yeah. And perhaps anger conquers fear in a way that makes us hold tight to what we've seen and heard and experienced so that when we have to tell it again, we remember. And I, pro I remember sitting with um, the Tamimi family and, and they are, if you look on um, YouTube, they're all over the place. And um, the daughter, she was 14 at the time, and her brother was um, being taken by the military. And she attacked the soldier, 14 years old. I'm like, this girl's got some spunk. This is my kind of girl. And we're sitting there talking to her, and she is like, you know, we're asking what seems to be silly questions, like, what made you do it? You know, like, you're just a kid and he was armed and he could have killed you and your brother. Like, what happened to make you stand up? And in the moment, it sounds like a really great question, right? Because we all want to find out what that thing is that we have to cling to, to do the right thing in very wrong situations. But her response was, there was no other option. That was her brother. That was her brother. Was she just gonna let somebody carry him away and never see him again? And maybe because we sit in this room, we don't understand what happens when the military takes, um, takes their children away. So I'll walk you through a story that I heard. And we did a court watch where we went into a military court and um, we heard the story, we got to talk to people and and comfort, really it was pastoral care, um, in crisis situations. We talked to families and parents whose children were taken at three and two o'clock in the morning. They are sleeping at night, sometimes silently, 40 to 50 poli uh, you know, m military soldiers enter the home. Sometimes they burst the door open. Sometimes they bang and wait for a response. But sometimes they simply remove the door from its hinges. <laughs> Enter the home, guns drawn and pointed at beds of sleeping children and parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, sisters, brothers. And they awaken to see guns in their faces their homes are filled. What was supposed to be haven has now become a war zone. And they are ill-prepared for battle. Unarmed. In their most vulnerable state. Awakened and their loved one is taken, often a child. Ripped from the home. Blindfolded. Their hands zip-tied behind them. They're placed into a vehicle, whether marked or unmarked and taken away. That's it. You don't know where. You don't know how long. You don't know what for. You don't know if they live. You don't know if they die. Some people hadn't heard from or seen their child in over a month. 15, 14, 13 years old, 12 years old taken and then they get to stand before a judge in a courtroom and the judge does not speak their language and the papers that have their charges are not written in their language and when they ask for an interpreter they're told come back to court in a month and we will have your translated documents 30 more days without knowing what they've been caught for. And if their parents somehow found out where they were, they would be in that courtroom. 
Otherwise, there were people that just assumed this is where my kid might be, so I'm just going to come, just in case. This is what happens. And I don't know how to capture it in a way that really does it justice, but I remember holding a mother who was weeping in the courtroom. And her child, he was 14 years old. He's like, please don't make my mother cry. Please don't, don't let my mother cry. She hadn't seen her kid in 35 days. No idea of what was happening. And there he was trying to hold it together and calm his mother from afar. And because we were present, the judge dismissed us from the room and the mother. And God only knows what took place after that. When we were able to come back in, he was gone. And we know nothing. There are a million stories that I could tell you about what it was like to be there. But I can tell you that every single day of that trip, I wept bitterly from my soul. And I wept in the same ways that I did when I lived in Oakland. As much as, you know, I lived in Southern California and I heard the helicopters, they call them ghetto birds, flying and hovering. They hover over LA all the time. No matter where you are, you can see the helicopters hovering over the city. And if you know exactly where they are, they're over the hood, black neighborhoods, right? Easy access ways to track what's going on in these neighborhoods. Um, and I've lived through the searchlights from the helicopters chasing somebody through backyards and, you know, being fearful that someone might have to run into my place because they don't have a place to hide. I know what that sounds like, but living in Oakland taught me what it sounds like after the gunshots. And those are things I will never forget. I had never until I moved to Oakland heard the screams that follow gunshots. They haunt me even now. If I hear it, I know what it sounds like. And I know what it's like someone died outside of my, um, my apartment on the concrete. I never knew how difficult it was to wash a blood stain out of the sidewalk. I learned that in Oakland. Our parent group, the Middle East Crisis Committee, is affiliated with the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. At its Washington conference this year, it changed its name. Our tour arrived at the conference during its last hour. And after its completion, I interviewed the campaign's executive director, Yusuf Manayer. So uh, our organization had been known as the U.S. Campaign to End the Israeli Occupation since uh, we started doing our work in 2001. Uh, and now, uh, 15 years uh, later, we've decided that it's time to switch to a name that's a little bit more appropriate and encompassing our values and our work. And we've decided to uh, adopt the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights as our new name. Uh, and uh, we believe that this is a name that really helps us state what we're for not just what we're against. Uh, and while we have always stood against the occupation and while we've always stood for the rights of Palestinians in the occupied territories as well as the rights of Palestinians in Israel and in the refugee camps, uh, we wanted a name that made it clear uh, that we, we stood for Palestinian rights regardless to uh, where Palestinians were. Uh, we also wanted to elevate uh, the word Palestinian uh, as part of uh, our name because it's often uh, that very identity that's the calculated target of Israeli policy. Um, so we're very excited about this change and moving forward under this banner. We feel that it is um, a, a shift that accompanies uh, a growing change in the discourse around this issue, one that uh, has for too long been framed around security uh, and is increasingly being framed around the rights of people. Uh, and that's um, Part and parcel of the work that we do is advocating for the rights of people um, and making that clear uh, to people, especially here in this country, that this is about um, the real lives of individuals on the ground and how they're being impacted by Israeli policies and um, in turn by American policies 
through their support uh, for Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you. On our tour was Travis Harden, a Lakota Hochuk. He lives now at Standing Rock, North Dakota. He's been twice to Palestine. He sang this song to the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights. Later during the tour, I interviewed Hardin about the great Indian resistance to the so-called DAPL pipeline in North Dakota. Travis Hardin, you've been out to Standing Rock for a, a good deal of time. You're not there now, you're on the Wheels of Justice uh, tour. But what's the latest? It's the 23rd of October. What have you heard? Well, I've heard, uh, first I heard there was uh, over a hundred people that were arrested yesterday. I saw the videos and I saw how the the um, the police surrounded the people and there were just there was a per peaceful uh, protest and a prayer. They went there to pray. That's what they do. They're not trying to ha have any violence or anything. They're not trying to you know cause trouble. They go to the site where they're where they're working, getting closer and closer to our camp. They're only two miles away now, and they're and so they try to they pray at the spot where they're they've been working at night and day. And um, so then they, they surround the police, the army of police and, and SWAT surrounded the people and they, they ended up chasing them and the people were, were running just like it was in Wounded Knee, you know, they, they ran for the rivers and the gullies and that's what happened yesterday and that's what I saw and I just feel bad because I'm not there, you know, and I wish I was there but this is important too, this wheels of justice, you know, and uh, comparing the... Uh, the marches that Martin Luther King believed in, you know, and that's kind of what we we believe. We have a dream too to stop to save our water and and have a you know a good clean water too. So to, let's start. You know, for those who really don't know, know much about this, you have uh, no dapple yeah. there. Explain from the beginning what's that about? Well, it's called the D dapple pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline. They even used our. Our tribe, you know, Dakota, Lakota, uh, you know, and their in the name of their their um, company, this big black snake that we're trying to stop to, that that may contaminate our Missouri River and our Oglala Aquifer that goes all the way down to Oklahoma. The whole Midwest is affected by this this uh, evil black snake. They're trying to build underneath our Missouri River, and you know, it's happened so many times in so many places, and this is such a big uh, amount of people that. That you have the water to drink that uh, from the Missouri River and the uh, Oglala Aquifer, uh, you know, Google it and see how how many people will be affected. Now, if you could just say a little bit about your own ethnic background. Yeah, I come from a family of warriors and and uh, um, human rights activists. You know, my uncle was Russell Meads and Ted Meads, Madonna Thunderhawks, my aunt and, and my aunt Phyllis Young and Mabel Ann Phillips and Bill Meads and. This means, um, you know, so our whole family has been f struggling and fighting in the struggle of our, of our people, you know, for ever since I was a young man, young boy, or, or not a young boy, but since I was a young young guy, I, you know, I, I learned how to sing, and that's what I do at the camp. I, I use my drum and I sing, and I sing at different places because, you know, our music is so powerful in our in our culture, and uh, you know, I'm Ho Chunk, and I'm I'm. Uh, Lakota, and uh, you know, I'm really proud to be a Native American, and I just wish I was at camp. But this is important too, so I'm really proud to be here to to learn all I can to take back to the camp and try to spread the word about uh, the, the, the Dapple Pipeline that we're trying to stop. How long were you at the camp? Now you're from South Dakota. This is all happening in North Dakota. Yeah, I was there. I tried to get there. It took me a while to get there, but I was there for almost uh, like 
two, almost two months, and um, you know, I was it's just so, such a beautiful place, beautiful thing. You got all these people, you know, thousands of people all coming together, and uh, there's more coming. There's some people have to leave. We, have, you know, some a lot of people have to work, but they come and they show their support of, from all races. I mean, from even from the other side of the world, we have people from Tibet and London, and you know, just different countries and places, and but mostly all over from this Turtle Island, North America. Now, you're on the wheels of Justice Tour. The uh, first Congregational Church of Old Lyme is sponsoring it. They sent uh, a van full of uh, food and supplies out to, uh, to to Standing Rock, and then. I also see on on the drum it says progressive for Palestine. Could you explain that? Yeah, I've been to Palestine and it's it's the same thing going on over there. You know, there's a a government and you know, and it's all back behind the United States money that they give they give uh, Israel um, four billion a year for military support when the you know the Palestine people that's that was their land and they're getting it all taken and it's like the reservations now and it's down to small dots you know of land that and they're still building the settlements everywhere and you know it's the same plight of the palestinian as the of us and the lakota people and the native american people you know and they're using the water over there they're damming up the water and now it's the same kind of thing is happening again here it's re history is re-repeating itself That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this has been The Struggle.